Thomas. So welcome, Bishop Thomas. Well, thank you very much. Welcome to all our viewers and listeners. Thank you, Ron. And I think we still have so many questions, we're not going to get through them all, but we'll do our best, folks, as we always do. We get as many in as we possibly can. Absolutely. Um, we don't want to do short shrift on any question. We want to give each one its proper due. That's so right. Well, we'll said. Take our time through that. And uh, Bishop, before we get rolling here, I know you've got a very busy schedule. And um, what's happening uh well, this week, Ron, people say, Bishop, when is your busy schedule, busy time? And I say every time. So it's always busy because obviously we're busy about the work of the gospel and the proclamation of the kingdom in the name of Jesus. So that's what we're all about. And these are some of the things that I'm about in the upcoming week. So on Friday, the 14th, of course, some people will say it's Valentine's Day. Other people will say it's the feast of Saints Cyril and Methodius. <laughs> so on the 14th, actually, I'll be delighted. I have uh, one of my my, uh, let's see, what, what do we say? Is It's not, it's biennial. Now, I always have to look at the word. Every other year, as you folks know, I visit all the schools in our diocese, all the Catholic schools. So I am going to visit, that is high schools. So I have a biennial visit on Friday, the 14th, to St. Francis de Sales High School. And of course, the typical visit is a mass, an all-school mass, and then a Q&A with juniors and seniors, and then usually a light lunch with maybe some of the students and the faculty. So I look very, very much forward to being back with uh, the Oblates and all the students at St. Francis de Sales School. Then on Saturday evening, folks, I will celebrate the Vigil Mass at uh, St. Mary in Tiffin. And then I've been invited by Father Matt Rader, the pastor, to offer the uh, keynote of their enrichment dinner. And imagine, of course, it's right around the time of Valentine's Day. And they do it intentionally because it's their marriage enrichment dinner and i'll give a talk at that supper that evening all are welcome please contact the parish for information and it's a special night for couples wedding couples husbands and wives to come together to celebrate their marriage and to be enriched in their own catholic marriage and then on that sunday i'll go to father raider's other parish and have a pastoral visit with sunday mass at saint pius the 10th in sycamore then sunday afternoon on the 16th i'll celebrate a confirmation mass for saint Joseph Sylvania Parish, and that's, of course, at our cathedral. Uh, on the 17th, I have one of my monthly priestly suppers, so dinner with six of our priests. We pray Vespers, evening prayer, and then have supper together, so it's always a delight to be with our priests. Tuesday the 18th, folks, I will take the day to go back to the Archdiocese of Philadelphia for the installation of the new Archbishop, former Bishop of Cleveland, Bishop Nelson Perez, who will be installed the Archbishop of Philadelphia on that day. And let's see... I think that gets us pretty much to the end, except that the following Wednesday on the 19th, once again, we'll be taping radio shows for Annunciation Radio. So we're always busy with many things, including taping these Bishop's Corner shows. So that's a calendar in a nutshell. That, that's all you got? <laughs> that's all we have for today. <laughs> so, so this is your slow season. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Wow. I don't and know. I always ask folks for your prayers, your good prayers, for my being able to fulfill my responsibilities, which include especially uh, being in so many places because it's so important for me as bishop to be all around the diocese with our young people, our older people, our parishes, our parishioners, as, as much as I can be present to people. That's my greatest desire to be present. So I hope you can continue to pray me through being able to do that as often as I can. It's a true blessing. Uh, and when people um, aren't seeing you face to face as you as you travel the entire diocese, you, you, the time that you're not doing that, you're here answering their questions on the bishop's <laughs> so it's like But they can always follow me on Facebook and social media, Ron. So they, they know where I am. Very accessible. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, shall we uh, move to a recent gospel? Please, thank you. Uh, this is a recent gospel from uh, Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its taste, with what can it be seasoned? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. It is set on a lampstand where it gives light to all in the house. Just so your light must shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly Father. 
first thoughts, Bishop. What a splendid gospel. Huh? Aren't Jesus' words wonderful where he uses these beautiful, practical examples that everyone can understand just exactly what he's talking about? So, folks, today I'd like to invite you, and of course, this is the gospel from this past Sunday, the fifth Sunday in Ordinary Time. I'd like to simply ask, our, ask us to look at ourselves to see how we are salt and light. So, we even hear Jesus say, You're, he calls us this, Ron. Isn't it something he tells us? You are the salt of the earth. He's telling us this is who you are. And then it's wonderful because he talks about, especially at that time and in that society, you know, salt was something not only which flavored things, but it preserved things because there wasn't the kind of refrigeration that we have today. So meats were salted, fish was salted. And it says, if it loses its taste, with what can it be seasoned? It's no longer good, but just to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So are we salt? Do we bring the flavor of Christian living, of our Catholic faith, or do we bring that flavor to our lives? And do we, if you will, season our daily lives, our work, our families, do we season them with Christ himself? And if not, then maybe we're not keeping up with what we should do. And the point is, though, he's telling us, you are salt. So he's encouraging us to be this flavor, this seasoning in the world and in society to be bring his flavor, if you will, and seasoning to the world. And then he says, you are light. So he tells us we're salt and we're light. And what does he mean by that? He says, don't hide your faith. Don't find your, hide your witness under a bushel basket. That's not what people do with a lamp. They put it on a lampstand so that the whole house can be filled with the light. It's just so are we called to be a light to our world, our neighbors, and that we need to shine, he says, before others. So we're to shine with his light, not our own light, because then notice it says, so they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly father. Notice he doesn't say, see your good, good deeds and glorify you, right? Because if you're salt and light, you're humble. So it's that we might glorify the Lord by allowing his light to shine through us. And so then be a witness and light up if you will. Have you ever heard that, Ron, where people say, oh, wow, well, when he or she walks into a room, they light up the room. Have you heard that phrase? Yes. And it's sort of like the person you always think that has a big personality or a lot of joy. Well, the question is, do we light up a room? Do we light up our office, our school, our place of, of visiting, our neighborhood, our family? Do we light it up with the light of Christ? And he gives us the strength to do that, especially through the Eucharist on Sunday, because he tells us, you are salt and light. That's beautiful. Um, lighting up the room and, and uh, glorifying the Heavenly Father in that way. Absolutely. It's a great reflection. Glorifying him in Christ. I love that. Uh, Bishop, uh, we got time to get a question in here. Sure. Let's and, let's go for it, folks. Yeah, I think we should head out to Bowling Green. Thank uh, you. Ann, uh, Thank you, Anne, for writing in. She says, Dear Bishop, can you please clear up any misunderstanding about annulments? Because uh, it's often said they are just Catholic divorces. This can lead people uh, really uh, not to trust tribunals. Thank you for your program. Thank you, Ann. Thanks, Ann, so much. And obviously, uh, I I don't think I could clear up every misunderstanding about annulments in a simple answer on the Bishop's Corner. But I appreciate your question, Ann, because over and over we get these questions and complete misperceptions, and as you say, misunderstanding about annulments. So I think it all boils down, if we could help our neighbors and those who question about this idea that, it, well, that's just Catholic divorce. Well, that's absolutely false. That is not a true statement. So let's clear it up just simply like this. The notion that annulments are just a Catholic's way of getting divorced stems from a misunderstanding about what the annulment process is for in the first place. Now, in a divorce, a civil divorce says that a valid marriage has now been dissolved, that the marriage never existed. But instead, a Catholic annulment says that there was never a valid marriage to begin with. See the difference, folks? Hmm. 
it doesn't say that a valid marriage is dissolved. No, it says a valid marriage just was not there in the first place. So we as Catholics believe that a valid marriage is indissoluble. It cannot be dissolved. But if it's proven, if it's proven that a man and woman never entered into a valid marriage in the first place, then they're not bound to the obligations that normally come along with one, and then they are granted an annulment. And of course, a tribunal, which every diocese has, a marriage tribunal, they never guarantee the outcome of a process, never guarantee that it will be granted, an annulment will be granted, because all of that, of course, depends on what has or has not been proven at the end of a process, a very, very careful process of investigation of the marriage in question. So I hope, Anne, that's helpful, and you can help your friends understand that annulments are not Catholic divorce. And I've heard from many people how helpful the tribunal office is here in, in helping people through that process during and that I th time. Thank you for mentioning that, and, and I would say we have a great tribunal. We have wonderful folks who are helping there. Monsignor Vasco is, of course, our judicial vicar, and I would say any question, Anne, that you or anyone else has, certainly the folks who are in our tribunal can help and would be glad to answer questions and assist you. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you, Bishop. Um, we are uh, out of time for this first half, so we're going to need to take a break here. Okay. Hold on, everybody. <laughs> Lots to come. Yep. We'll come back with more of the Bishop's Corner after this. Blessed be God. Thank you to Rieger's Church Supplies and Religious Gifts, the official sponsor of the Bishop's Corner videos. Rieger's is located at 4100 Secor Road in Toledo. Call 419 419- 474-4740 or visit on the web at Riegers.com. And we welcome you back to the Bishop's Corner here on Annunciation Radio. Bishop Daniel Thomas, always eager to answer your questions. Glad to have you with us, everyone. Thank you. And uh, so accessible, too, because there are so many ways to get your questions uh, to the bishop. You can go to AnnunciationRadio.com and uh, submit your question on the template that pops up there. Uh, you can click on the Bishop's Corner link. You can also email your questions, Bishop at AnnunciationRadio.com, or use the uh, quick form on the Annunciation Radio app. Uh, we do ask that you uh, you do include your first name in the uh, parish or town that you're from, so the bishop has some idea uh, who he's talking to. And we do try to get to uh, all the questions that come in. Sometimes we run out of time and we get more questions than we have time for. But uh, And Ron, this time we had a super abundance of yeah. questions, so we'll keep on pushing. That's right. And, we and we're grateful, folks. Keep sending. Yeah, and we hang on to them, so eventually you'll hear your question. That's right. For sure. But uh, Bishop, with that in mind, uh, let us move to... Uh, a question from Marty, who uh, is listening online at AnnunciationRadio.com or perhaps on the app. Uh, Marty writes, Dear Bishop Thomas, how come so many bishops around the country are involving themselves in the immigration crisis? Thank you, Marty. Well, I guess my very initial response to that would be it's not only bishops who are involving themselves in the immigration of crisis issues, but in fact, it's faithful Catholics and Christians from around the whole country. So bishops represent their people, and there are many, many people who are involved in this. But specifically, Marty, regarding bishops, obviously they are involved, bishops are involved in any situation where there is a need for pastoral care of their people. And so it's very, very evident that at the border and in the question of immigration, that there is pastoral care necessary and perhaps obviously not being afforded people who are immigrating to the United States for one reason or another, oftentimes because of the deplorable conditions of where they're coming from. So in regard to the question of bishops, and Marty, I would direct you to the uh, website of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, and I would say really the answer to your question, why are so many bishops involving themselves? Marty, I think the singular answer is because uh, it is Catholic social teaching and they are living out that Catholic social teaching on immigration. So let me just give you a couple notes here. The Catholic Church in the United States is an immigrant church with a long history embracing diverse newcomers since its 
inception and providing assistance and pastoral care to immigrants, migrants, refugees, and people on the move. Our church has responded to Christ's call for us to welcome the stranger among us. For in this encounter with the immigrant, the migrant, the refugee in our midst, we encounter Christ himself. So that's the fundamental reality and the Catholic social teaching, Marty, that we follow. And there's a rich body of Catholic social teaching, including papal encyclicals, bishops' statements, pastoral letters, that reinforces our moral obligation to treat the stranger as we would treat Christ himself. So I think it's important also to recognize that we acknowledge the current immigration system in the United States is flawed and seriously in need of reform. And the church, through caring for immigrants, is also encouraging our government to look at a comprehensive set of recommendations to change U.S. laws and policies to bring about a more humane and just immigration system in the United States. Now, don't jump to the conclusion, as some people do, that bishops think that everybody should come over the border willy-nilly of whoever they are. Absolutely false. Absolutely not. We do not advocate that people who break the law uh, should be just entering into our country. No, absolutely not. Sadly, Marty, that's what people say and think. But I think it's important to read up about the church's social teaching and what we actually proclaim, and that is that there should be a just immigration system which is followed and cares for people in a humane way. Hope that's helpful. Very helpful. Thank you, Bishop. Um, let's go to George in Toledo. Bishop Thomas, is, the, is in the list of Catholic non-negotiables, <laughs> Is it true that abortion is the highest, most important non-negotiable for Catholics? What else would make up this list? Thank you, George. Well, George, first I have to share with you, I'm not familiar with the language that you use. So the list of Catholic non-negotiables, I've never read the list. <laughs> I don't know where the list is from or what list you might be looking at. And But then you jump right away to abortion. So I'm presuming you're asking about life issues and about respect for life regarding the whole spectrum of human life. So, George, if I've made the right interpretation there for your question, I would say that the answer comes from what we recently heard from Archbishop Joseph Nauman, who is the uh, chair of the Bishop's Pro-Life Committee for the United States, who recently had his unlimited visit with the Holy Father, and based on a document that the, the bishops have just approved, he asked the Holy Father point blank, he said, Holy Father, is not the question of abortion regarding care for life in the womb, is that not the preeminent issue regarding the respect for human life? The Holy Father, Pope Francis, responded, of course, that is the preeminent issue. So I think that might be, George, where you were going with that question. And I think we have to say when we're talking about defenseless human babies in the womb, that obviously rises to the preeminent level regarding all other questions of life. Of course, you say, what else would make up that list? We list things like the elderly, especially those who could be so defenseless regarding euthanasia. It involves the poor. It involves immigrants. It involves those who are uh, persecuted, perhaps because of race. So there's all sorts of other human life issues which we advocate strongly for as Catholics, of course. But the preeminent issue, and that includes, for example, people, prisoners, all of those things. But the preeminent issue is for those who are the defenseless pre-born children in the womb. George, I hope that answered the question. Very good. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, George. Um, we've got time for uh, a question from uh, Tim at uh, St. John Defiance. This is number nine. Thank you. Um, question for Bishop Thomas. Recently, some of our elder people received communion seating in the last pew of the church because the pews up front were full. However, someone stopped going to the back pews and they do uh, not attend mass anymore. What is a church policy for elderly people who sit in the back pews to receive communion? Thank you. 
Well, thank you, Tim. Obviously, I, I think your uh, question has a number of questions, and it's sort of packed with questions. So the first question is, I simply don't know off the top of my head what happens as a custom in your parish regarding the elderly or the disabled and where they have perhaps a reserved section for them in the church. So, for example, in some of our churches, the elderly or the disabled or those in wheelchairs or those who have a difficulty walking, oftentimes there's a place, and you indicate here maybe uh, that it was in the front. Oftentimes parishes have them in the front. Sometimes they have an actual section reserved. Other times they actually are in the back of the church because they can't make their way up to the front of the church. And as a result, during the rite of Holy Communion, someone, whether that's the priest, the deacon, or an extraordinary minister, obviously attends to making sure that those people who have attended Mass also receive Holy Communion. So I hope you understand, I don't know what the placement is in your church, which is the custom. I certainly feel, and, and I have no idea, the first question I would have for you, Tim, is did you go your, to your pastor and discuss this? Did you go and visit with your pastor and say, what, you know, uh, these people did not receive communion and now they're disgruntled. You indicate they don't attend to Mass anymore. Heaven help us, that's tragic. So I, my heart would break if someone did not attend Mass simply because they hadn't received communion one day. Maybe they were forgotten. Maybe somebody humanly just forgot to bring them communion. I think there could be a number of reasons here, Tim, but the very first thing you should have done, if you had not, the first thing you should have done was go to your pastor and make the pastor aware of this. There is no pastor in the diocese, I, I believe, who wouldn't want to make certain that anyone who is elderly or disabled has received our Lord in the sacrament and communion while they're attending Mass. So I think that's very, very important. Of course, there is no policy, Tim, about people who sit in the back pews. <laughs> but I would also say sometimes people sit in the back pews and we don't know that they're there mm -hmm. or that they're this disabled. And maybe they're disgruntled, but they've not told anybody. And if they didn't tell anybody, how would they know to have communion brought back to them? So I think there, there's this question is packed with a lot of uh, minefields, <laughs> if you will. It's a minefield. But just so you're aware, again, go to the sources from the guidelines for the celebration of the sacraments with persons with disabilities from 2017 from the USCCB. All human beings are equal in dignity in the sight of God. Moreover, by reason of their baptisms, all Catholics share the same divine calling. And number two, Catholics with disabilities have a right to participate in the sacraments as fully as other members of the local ecclesial community. And canon law, canon 835, paragraph 4, sacred ministers cannot deny the sacraments to those who seek them at appropriate times, are appropriately disposed, and are not prohibited by law from receiving them. So, Tim, I, I simply have to say, I don't know your policy in your church of where those po folks sat. I don't know if it was an oversight. Maybe someone simply forgot that those people were there. Maybe they weren't even informed that they were there. But I think the very first answer would be, go to your pastor and to try to invite those people back if they're not returning to church. And with great love, and affection and care, invite them back to where they should be able to sit in a place, then someone would know that they're not physically able to approach as everyone else is in a communion procession. Hope that's helpful. Very good. Thank you, Bishop. And uh, we've only got about a minute left. But uh -oh. I, I, wanted, I saved a, a hard-hitting investigative question for you uh, for last. <laughs> get ready, folks. Here I we go. That, uh, that out of the way, Jay on social media asks, do you ever watch TV or movies for fun? <laughs> What are your favorites if you do? Thank you, Jay. And I always tell people I don't have time to watch TV. <laughs> and that's simply the true answer. And frankly, I have to be honest with you. I watch very little TV, Jay. And what I do watch, I put the news on my iPad. I, th I think I've told this before on the Bishop's uh, Corner. My brother taught me to listen to the radio because there were no iPads at that time when I was ordained a priest. He said, you know, you should be listening to the radio in the morning. And my spiritual director said, listen to the 20-minute radio show it was called uh, 
the, the station was KYW in Philadelphia, all news, all the time. And in 20 minutes, you got all the news. And my spiritual director would say, you get the news so you know what to pray for all day, mm. which was great. So frankly, Jay, I really don't watch a lot of TV other than the news. I certainly told people before I, I thoroughly enjoyed the series uh, Downton Abbey when that was on TV. Uh, I watched NCIS. I think that's a great show, for example. Uh, but I don't get to watch a lot. I would love to go to the movies. I can't tell you the last time I was to the movies. Probably once. I only see one movie a year usually. And for example, looking at the Oscars and the nominations, I would love to go see 1917, for example. I, that looks like a really great movie I would love to see. And uh, there's a lot of movies I'd like to see, but I simply don't have the time. <laughs> Thank you, but uh, I certainly am interested in seeing those things. Yeah, you get that shoehorned into your calendar. I, I would love to shoehorn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bishop, we are out of time. Could you uh, give us a prayer and a blessing? Surely. So, just as we listened to the and reflected on the gospel of this past Sunday, fifth Sunday in ordinary time, so we'll pray the prayer, the collect, the opening prayer from the mass. Let us pray. Keep your family safe, O Lord, with unfailing care that relying solely on the hope of heavenly grace, they may be defended always by your protection. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Bishop. Thank you so much for listening and for sending your questions in. Hopefully you will join us next time for the next edition of the Bishop's Corner. Ron, thanks for filling in for the other Ron. Ron, Ron Miller. Miller is back next week. And we're grateful, and folks, always grateful for your tuning in, watching, listening, and being part of the Bishop's Corner. Many blessings. Bye-bye.